and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a second round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. Like what you hear? Click the thumbs up. Don't care for it? Click the thumbs down. Good luck to all of our contestants. The Haunted Author Written by Marcus Clark Performed by David Tyson for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and the Evil Idol Competition What can I do for you, sir? I asked blandly, astonished. He was a tall, broad-shouldered man in a rough pea jacket and scowled pretentiously. Pulled me into an honest livelihood, he answered. It was such a strange request that I could only stare. Don't you understand? He said, seating himself with rough vehemence. I want to become a reputable member of society. I want some honest employment. But, my good sir, why do you come to me? Your motive is most excellent, but an honest employment is the last thing at my disposal. That be blowed, he said. You can give me an honest fortune if you like. You know you could. But I don't want that. No, I'm fly to that game. You'll have some blessed elder brother that nobody knowed of. Coming back from New Zealand and succeeding to the ancestral mansion. Or you'll get me pitched out of me gilded chariot at the church door and marry me wife that ought to be. To someone else. No, I know you. I only want a modest competence. Nobody interferes with that. Your language is even more mysterious than your appearance, my friend. I said. Pshaw, sure, he said. I never heard a man outside of a book said, Pshaw, never. Don't you know me? I looked at him steadily, and it seemed that I ought to know him. That hat, that pea jacket, that knotted scarf around his muscular throat, those fierce eyes, all were familiar to me. You don't happen to have any marks about you, I asked while a cold sweat broke upon my brow. He laughed. That bitter laugh which I had described so often. I have a peculiar mole on the back of me neck. The tip of my left ear is shot away. My right side still bears the mark of Pompey's claws when he defended his young mistress Alice in the Lonely Swamp. I've lost a little finger on me right hand. And three pair shaped winds Besides the usual allowance of strawberry marks. There was no mistaking him. It was my villain. I knew his bloodthirsty nature and dreaded the tremendous struggle which experience told me was to follow. But why come here? I urged. No, I'm sick of it, said my villain doggedly. No, I ain't to be badgered anymore. Or ain't a respectable business. First, I was Jabez Jamark. Then, Blackwell the Smuggler. Then, Curl Lewis Carleon. Then, a poacher. Then, a burglar. Then, an unjust steward. And now I'm just an escaped convict. It was true. The unhappy creature before me had figured in my world. Renowned novels. In all those capacities. What well, ain't because I'm out all night in all sorts of weather. Mostly thunderous. It ain't because I'm often drunk. Always in debt. And totally disreputable. What well, ain't because I've murdered a large variety of mothers. And brought the great heirs of a corresponding number of aged fathers with sorrow to the grave. It ain't because my language altogether is ridiculous, and I leave out more H's and put in more oaths in my conversation than any natural man did yet. It ain't that. No. He cried. 
waxing wroth. It's because I'm always left at the end of the third volume, if I'm still alive, without hope of mercy or promise of repentance. I shuddered. Take some brandy, I said, and push him the decanter. He took it, and filling half a tumbler with neat spirit, drained it at a gulp. I knew he would. The beast, under my direction, invariably took his liquor in that fashion. Well, is that right? Well, is it just, governor? Your comic servant warns up with the chambermaid. Your aristocrat villain, the Marquis, my master, who poisons his niece and shoots his aunt with an air gun. He's all right. He's never hung in chains, or tucked to Newgate, or starved to death in a deserted drive on the Dingings in Bendigo. But why waste words? Are we not alone? No, Sam, but the whistling of the wind in the wide chimneys of the moated grange. No footsteps, but that of a midnight mouser as she creeps stealthily to her prey. <laughs> Thou art mine, and ha <laughs> ha, indeed. I guessed how it would happen. My experience as a novel writer told me as much. Just as the enraged ruffian advanced to seize me, a newcomer appeared upon the scene. By his wavy hair, square toe Wellington's massive watch chain and handkerchief that hung from the right hand pocket of his shooting coat, I knew him at once. He was Sir Aubrey de Briancourt. Assist me, I exclaimed. The look of scorn he gave me was sufficient to daunt a bolder man, but I knew of a spell by which I could compel him. Hiss, I said in a thrilling whisper. Proud scion of Lordly House, there is another Sir Aubrey. Refuse me aid and young Fairfield will assume your name and title. These minions are beyond my power, but remember, you are to be continued in our next. The threat made me pale at the cheek. Even of one whose ancestors bled on Bosworth, and the baronet waved the white hand towards the back door. Take my cabriolet, dog, he said. With that courteous which characterizes the British aristocrat, I need scarcely remark that I leapt into the cabriolet and was soon driving with the rapidity of lightning towards Goodman's Gully. Fast behind came the echo of hooves. The lightning flashed incessantly, and the negro who held the reins was white with fear. All at once, a man clad in a red shirt jumped from behind a bush and seized the head of the mare. Who are you? I cried. The most abused of all, he said. I am the typical digger. I am the man whom you and the others of your tribe have made to eat banknotes as sandwiches. I have shod my horse with gold and swilled champagne, which I detest, out of stable buckets. Am I to pass my life in finding repeatedly gigantic nuggets and being perpetually robbed of the same? Must I never shave? Shall the tyranny of the fiction monger compel me to sleep in my boots? Calm yourself, my friend, I said. There is not much harm done. I know of some poor fellows whom the fiction mongers have treated much more rudely. At that instant, the demonic howls of my pursuers were borne upon the blast. That may be, roared the digger of romance. But I will be revenged on thee. Come. There was never a cabriolet yet that did not do so under such circumstances, and my captor led me away. He paused at the door of an unusual bush inn. How well I know it. And striking three blows upon that door, they invariably struck three loud blows. We were admitted into a long apartment 
I beheld with astonishment that all the personages whom I had imagined the creatures my own, too fertile brain were there. Wretch! cried the fair Madeline. Why did you not untie me to the duke? You know you only changed your mind at the last moment. Monster! said the lovely Violet. You made me pass three nights of horror in the Red Farm when one stroke of your pen would have freed me. Christian dog, roared Mordecai the Jew. I was born with charitable impulses and should have lent in peace the humble shilling upon the ragged coat of poverty had not your felon soul plunged me into crime to gratify the taste of a blood and thunder loving public. And I remarked Henry Mortimer, with that cynical smile that I had so often depicted, curling his proud lip. Did I wish to throw my elder brother down a well in order to succeed to his name and heritage? No, I loved him fondly, madly, as you took pains to state in your earlier chapters. Away with him, hissed Lady Millicent the poisoner. I knew not of the deadly power of strychnine until he told me. Twas he that let me linger in consumptions for forty pages, Folio, cried Coralette de Belleisle, the planter's daughter. Twas he that blighted my voluptuous contours with an entirely unnecessary railway accident, wept the lovely Geraldine. Away with him! Mercy! <laughs> I cried, gazing in terror on their well-known lineaments. Mercy! cried the lost heiress Isabel Bonmaya. When for two long hours you deliberated whether my sainted mother or the poacher's wife should give me birth. Mercy for thee? Oh, no, no, no! I trembled over the abyss. Why seek to despair my ennui with this esprit à clarie, mon ami? Sacre, let the puff but be the scape. My dujeuner de fourchette awaits. The corcadoire is superb. The two ensemble, all that could be desired. Voila! The digger swung me over the yawning grave. All the buttons in my waistcoat gave away and, for an instant, my life hung literally by a thread. Well, you might me respectable, said the villain. Never, the button cracked. I was going, going, gone. When the alarm bell sounded, the door was burst open and Bridget entered. It's the boy from the printers for the proofs she said. Tell him to wait, said I, and wiping the sweat from my intellectual brow, I seized my pen and in ten lines had gotten my villain comfortably in irons at Norfolk Island. Thanks for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. By doing so, you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on August 15th, based on your votes, the top 25 contestants will advance to the third round, which begins September 1st, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.